Hello, today is Friday, December 13th, 2019. I'm Joe Schmidt from TC2, and this is Staying Connected. I'm joined by my fellow TC2 colleagues, Teresa Knudsen and Julie Gardner. They are the leaders of TC2's contract compliance and optimization practice. This will be part one of a two-part series where we discuss the contract terms that you can negotiate to help you save some money on your ICT services. Teresa and Julie, the three of us, we've recorded a few podcasts lately where we've looked at how to address some common problems with network transport expenses. And Teresa, you and I also looked at some potential supplier consolidation in the TEM space. But today we're going to look at billing terms that can improve an enterprise's bottom line. So thanks, guys, for joining me. And I can't wait to hear what the two of you have to say about this. So, Teresa, why don't you take it away? Hey, Joe, and thanks. It's nice to be back. I guess one of the most basic provisions that all of our clients should seek is to include in any carrier agreement that all service components must be installed before billing commences. Sounds very basic, but I'm going to give you an example. So let's talk about an MPLS circuit. That means the carrier cannot start billing until both the access and port are installed and the circuit has passed their carrier's acceptance testing and they've allowed you a short window to do your internal acceptance testing on that circuit. And that interval for your internal acceptance testing can range anywhere from three to five days. So it sounds very basic. The suppliers can't start billing until the circuit is available to you and usable. But this isn't something that you automatically get in your agreements. The carriers will often use their default language that says as soon as any service component, not all service components are available, but when any component is installed, it can start billing. So if you have access with no port, you can't use it. If you have port with no access, you can't use it. You need both components, so you should only pay when all the service components are up and available. So we've seen this become a very material issue at clients that are in the midst of a migration or a service turnup. So even if you have a great provision like this in your contract, it actually doesn't mean your carrier is adhering to it. So like all things in telecom, get the language, negotiate for it, but also check to make sure that the suppliers are adhering to it. Right. And another key provision to negotiate is language that prevents billing overlap. And by billing overlap, we mean the period of time during which you have what we call your legacy services billing along with the new services. So the new service could be an upgrade or a replacement of what you previously had. We call the legacy service. And for our larger clients that typically go through a constant cycle of upgrade activity every year, this language is key and it's worth six to seven figures a year. Now, some carriers will insist that the credit has to be limited to the standard disconnect interval. This means we'll give you 30 days credit for a domestic service and 60 days worth of credit for an international service that matches their standard disconnect interval. The problem with this language is that if a disconnect isn't sent in, the billing overlap continues. The best language you can get would require the carriers, and they will, agree to prevent all billing overlap, meaning you'll have no duplicate billing of legacy and new services. And requiring the carriers to prevent any overlap ensures that they have a vested interest in getting those legacy services, those disconnects processed in a timely manner. Wow, those are clearly some key provisions that enterprises better have in their deals. Are there any other things they should have in their deals? (laughs) There's always more. Um, So in addition to those two provisions we just discussed, you should also make sure you have included language that waives charges for incomplete disconnects. So say you submit a disconnect order for an MPLS circuit, and the next month you see your port fall off the bill, but access is still billing. You need to make sure that when disconnect orders are placed, that there's contractual language that requires the supplier to disconnect all service components. And we see this happen all the time. Yeah, absolutely. I'm working on a client right now that forgot to disconnect the access that was associated with its data center port. This was a massively expensive mistake, a six-figure mistake. Unfortunately, they didn't have the language that Teresa mentioned, but you can bet it's on their radar for their next procurement. Yeah, and it's it's a really good point. So even if you don't have these provisions we're talking about today, take notes and keep them in your file. So kind of notes for next time when you're negotiating or going to market to make sure you get these provisions captured. And these pain points really become kind of a roadmap to how you improve your deal the next time. 
So again, keep in mind that these provisions are normally negotiated when you get, you know, are in a fully, you know, competitive RFP situation and they aren't likely to be something you'll get if you're just doing a directed no negotiation with your primary suppliers. So I need to ask, is there any more? Oh, I've got one more for you. You know, most often we hear about how long it takes to get services installed. There's usually, you know, almost always situations where services don't get turned up in the time frame that the clients want. But there's also cases in which the carriers will deliver service before you want it. And that means they'll start billing earlier than you had planned. There are some good contractual provisions that you can achieve to address this type of a situation, too. For example, if the parties agree to what we call a service delivery due date, you can require the carrier to use reasonable efforts to deliver the service on that specific due date. If the carrier delivers the service on an earlier date than what you agreed upon, it has to notify you. And then only if you agree to accept the service earlier than that originally agreed upon due date can the carrier install and begin billing you. If you don't expressly agree, then the default would be the original date, and you won't pay anything until that original due date happens. Yeah, these are all like really great ideas. And I get, we always go back to the basics of even though you negotiate for all these wonderful provisions to save you money, you actually need to go back and audit and check that the suppliers are adhering to the terms and conditions in your deal. So don't assume that just because you've got it in the contract that they're doing it. Really go back and double check. Okay, thanks, Teresa. And thank you as well, Julie. Now, if you found today's discussion useful, Please make sure to listen for part two, where Julie, Therese, and I will discuss the critical terms to support billing reviews and TEM services. And as always, if you do have questions or you would like to discuss this topic further, you can contact Julie, Teresa, me, or any of our TC2 and LB3 colleagues by giving us a call or sending us an email. And you can also stay current by subscribing to Staying Connected on any number of platforms, including Google Play, YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes, and Spotify. I also encourage you to check out our TC2 and LB3 websites and to follow us on LinkedIn.